Hello and welcome to this presentation about the automated generation of simulations for traffic operations. My name is Lucas and I'll be your host for the next 10 to 15 minutes. We'll be talking about what we actually do at Transcali, which is our spin-off, our ETH spin-off from Zurich, which focuses on generating actually simulations for very large cities, for example, London or Zurich. Now, before we start, I'd like to quickly go through the agenda. We're going to talk about who we are, then we'll talk about how we set up historic type of simulations, and then we'll look into how can we upgrade them into real time simulations or something close to a digital twin. Before we do that, let me quickly introduce who Transcality is. We're a company that was founded roughly a year ago here in Zurich, and we currently have nine multinational employees with tech backgrounds in engineering, machine learning, and mathematics. We're funded by ETH Zurich, the local university here, and we're an official ETH spin-off. And therefore we actually have the luck to be highly financially and strongly academically supported by the university itself. We were um, lucky to have gotten six signed contracts in 2022. One example is a real-time prediction for a part of the Swiss highway network. Another one is the automated construction site evaluation for the city of Zurich. And I'll be talking about some of these examples in this presentation. We're currently setting up collaborations with the largest engineering companies or offices in Switzerland and Austria, some of the partners you see here on the right. <clears throat> We're software independent, and this means that we actually build the architecture around the traffic simulator and therefore are kind of unbiased towards any traffic simulator. And we got access to traffic data from 40 plus cities worldwide. Maybe a quick background of our research. Um, I myself and also my co-founders, Gabriel and Sasan, spend a lot of time in high resolution loop detector data. Uh, we were able together with others to gather data from 40 plus cities around the world. We also published them. It's um, a data set called UTD19. And you also see the um, <clears throat> website right here on the left. It's an open source data set. And I um, think it would be great if you could have a look at some of you might already know it. Now I focused on evaluating kind of the macroscopic performance of these cities. And for that, we actually looked into simulations, into very large scale simulations where every single individual vehicle was tracked and where every single individual vehicle was also modeled. So <clears throat> the macroscopic is something that refers to the size of the network and not to the model itself. And we also looked into some kind of prediction. How could we look into different congestion patterns? And after my PhD, we decided that we could actually start an ETH Pioneer Fellowship, which is a grant which allows you to kind of start your own company. Now, what we actually do is, or what our vision is, is best shown in the next slide. Essentially, what you see here is an intersection in the city of Zurich at a more colder day, let's say, here in Zurich. And <clears throat> what the idea of our spin-off is, is that we turn anything that moves around here on this image into a digital twin, meaning we have a digital replica of everything that moves around here. But not just at this intersection level, but at the full city level. So we're able to kind of understand what happens at the network level for every single individual vehicle. And we understand if an accident happens in a certain intersection, what kind of wider consequences this could have. Now note that this is an operational type of model. You might have heard of planning versus operations. Now we're definitely on the operations part where it's about short term um, analysis, but also short-term predictions. So 
um, compared to others that focus on longer term issues in mobility, we try to focus on rather short term up to a year kind of um, predictions and analysis. So let's now discuss how we actually generate these models. And let's keep in mind that the whole idea is to have a completely automated and scalable pipeline to do so. So instead of taking relatively long to construct such a operational model, what we try to do is to generate these models within a single week. <clears throat> and for that, what we use is basically a, a, a coordinated pipeline of different tools that we activate um, depending on the necessities. We start by generating a endogenous or exogenous demand. What we mean by that, we'll be discussing in the next two slides, but essentially it's a way to understand where do people come from and where do they wanna to go to inside the network. So it's a demand definition. <clears throat> in the next step, what we try to run is a simulation. And this traffic simulator is kind of independent of whatever we do. So we built the architecture around the simulator, but not the simulator itself. <clears throat> so you could plug in here, for example, Sumo, which is one of the most famous open source simulator, traffic simulators there are, developed by the German DLR. We then basically run a two-step calibration process where we first focus on the district level so for example, let's say a subcenter of the city of Zurich, and then we go one step down and we focus on the road level itself. And at the end, we obviously do a validation, which is different from the calibration because essentially uses a different data set, for example, travel times to double check if the model actually behaves as reality does. And the last part is basically just putting everything together so that it would also run in real time and some nice visualizations like the ones that you just saw. So let's move on by actually looking at every single of these um, four steps or four and a half steps that you have outlined here. And let's start with just the road network generation, which we actually do based on open data. So we start off by um, having OpenStreetMap as the base layer, which OpenStreetMap is the publicly available kind of open source mapping, which is available for most cities um, around the world in, you know, different types of quality levels. So that's why afterwards we need certain corrections. Like if there is no information about speed limits, we would try to impute that based on the neighborhood and based on the type of road that we're looking at. We're also imputing some of the turn lanes and their layouts if necessary. And then we're looking at adjustments of priorities and traffic signal location if we feel it's necessary for the model or that there's a high kind of probability that there is a traffic signal, but it's not recorded in, in OpenStreetMap. We then go on and we start reducing the network. And what we do by what we mean by that is by basically that we reduced the um, number of links inside the network. So imagine that a residential road that just has a basically a dead end going to a single house is not very meaningful. It's not very important for usually these network type of models that we're creating, but you know, the feeder, the residential feeder into this um, residential roads might actually be relevant. So we might want to keep the th this road, but not every single individual residential road that just goes to a single house, for example, with no way of going somewhere else. So what we use is a, um, a notion which is called between the centrality, which is fairly famous in network science, which tells you about um, how central a road is, how many shortest paths would go over this road. And we then kick out, um, for example, in our Zurich network, roughly 50% of all residential roads based on that between the centrality. It's kind of a modified between the centrality, but it, it goes along lines, the, the, the between the centrality itself. <clears throat> we then continue to um, actually match 
all the traffic data that we have. So we first do this. Um, usually we would have access to some loop detector data, which are these um, uh, which are these loops that are integrated in front of traffic signals very often or right after traffic signals that usually control the traffic systems themselves and that cities would have access to. So they measure how many cars drove over it. They measure if uh, how, how long these um, cars would stay at a certain location and would cover the loop detectors. And that gives us an information on how fast and how many vehicles drove over these detectors. Or we would go and match basically floating car data, which is also abbreviated as FCD in many cases, to the most probable edge. This can be, for example, GPS or so phone location data. But let's continue for now with basically the um, loop detector <clears throat> type of data. We then also add public transport um, uh, systems using a, a GTFS kind of feed, which is uh, the general transit feed standard, which uh, originally was developed by Google and now is kind of an open source standard for defining timetables and defining how routes actually um, are going through the network. And that actually allows us to import that directly into the model as well. <clears throat> this is, for example, a illustration of the model that we generated for the city of London. <clears throat> and you see it's fairly large. You then go into the details and you see that every single um, loop detector here, for example, these rect rectangles at the end are actually matched to the network. So you see all the, ne the, the, the details and you also see the traffic signals um, in the network. The different colors, by the way, are the different hierarchy of roads. So the red ones are basically residential roads. The blue ones are um, higher hierarchy um, roads like primary and secondary roads according to OpenStreetMap's hierarchy system. <clears throat> we then go on and what we essentially try to do is a endogenous demand modeling. This works in a nutshell very similar to the idea that, well, we're trying to match basically the number of routes that go over a, a detector with its actual numbers, right? So that's not, it's a fairly simple idea, but it's a fairly hard problem because there's, as you can imagine, if there's only two detectors in this network, right? It's going to be very, very hard, or it's gonna be indefinitely, um, there's gonna be indefinite number of, of of solutions for this problem because you can essentially create indefinitely many routes almost that go over these detectors and match the counts. But if you have more and more and more counters or more and more detectors, this constrains your system in such a way that it becomes less random how you actually create your um, <clears throat> your demand. But essentially what we, what we try to do is basically we take into account the traffic conditions and we then have a meta model heuristics, which um, tries to integrate basically <clears throat> the traffic simulator as an analytical model, which therefore makes it run much faster than running the simulation itself at every iteration of the optimization problem. What we find then is that we have fairly similar trends as MATSIM, which is um, a multi-agent transport um, um, simulator, which you might have heard of. Uh, and you see that basically our approach has similar trends. This is a, a diagram that shows you basically five different regions in the city of, of Zurich. And what you see is basically that you have this similar in and outgoing trends within these five regions coming from Matsim versus this endogenous demand approach, which is again, solely based on loop detectors. We then go on and we start to calibrate the simulation. So once we have some kind of rough idea what happens on the, on the, on the demand side, we start calibrating also the supply side. And what we mean by that is we focus on traffic supply and traffic behavior parameters uh, traffic signal control, which we haven't touched upon in um, this lecture so far. 
and then on the coordination of this traffic signal control, as well as fundamental diagram um, parameters. And we then allow for a certain kind of um, um, uh, flexibility for the origin and destinations to move within certain boundaries to correct for certain issues that we caught, we didn't catch with the first kind of OD calibration or the first OD estimation that we did in the beginning with the endogenous demand <coughs> modeling. Now, what are the objectives? Well, we look at the edge level and the district level, as we said before. So first we look at the district level. We use the MFDs, um, which are essentially the average flows and average densities inside a district. And this is exactly what we do here, right? So at the district level, you see below, um, over the hour of the day, the average per hour. And you see that these averages go up to roughly 500 vehicles per hour. That's a very um, usual number in, in district level flows. You see that there's basically in this map a roughly seven, uh, six different colors. And these six different colors correspond to the six different regions that you see below here in the lowest graph. And the top graph shows you certain selected roads inside of the city of Zurich, where we then go and do a calibration at the second level. Now, once the model is calibrated, um, what you can do then is basically a database traffic flow prediction. The idea here is that we have some kind of idea what will happen in the next 15, 30, 45 minutes, up to one hour. And to be able to do so, what we did is we trained a neural network, fairly simple model, where we try to just infer what will happen in this next hour based on historic data. Uh, how do we do this? Well, what you see here is the blue line is the historic data that was actually measured. And you see in orange and the four stars kind of our next prediction that we do at a certain moment in time. And you see, obviously, we don't capture all the stochasticity that goes on in this curve, but we do fairly okay in this um, plot here. Uh, if you look at the, the error distribution on the right hand side, we use again the GEH, which is this kind of simulation error where, um, where we say that a model below five or m m values below five are a good model usually. Um, we end up with a 85th percentile, which is below 3.7. And that allows us to basically say that um, here, um, across all the predictions that we did in all of the city of Zurich, we do have a pretty good prediction going on. But what can we do with this real time kind of prediction um, then afterwards in the simulation? This is exactly what this last slide is about. The idea really is that we put everything together. Let's start off on the very left side. We start by having a real-time API to loop detectors across the city. So let's say in the city of Zurich, we have roughly 1,500 detectors that are connected or that could be connected to a real-time API. We then actually um, calibrate our ML model that you just saw in the last slide. And we do a prediction of the traffic flow and the occupancy um, for the next hour for every single road and every single lane that is monitored in the system. We then go on and we use our endogenous demand modeling that you saw three slides ago, where the idea is to just based on flows, basically reverse engineer the ODs that possibly were happening in this network, or basically the origin and destinations that could have um, been happening in these or been modeled in this um, situation. And we use that to kind of generate a predictive demand. So a demand which happens in the next hour. And here what we do is we do a, um, we then run this into the simulation. 
And in the simulator, we can define, predefine, for example, um, different measures. The first one could be that we do nothing. Measure one could be that we do nothing. And uh, measure two could be that we do some ramp metering along some highways. And this would show us that in the case where we don't do anything, so measure one, congestion would go up and emissions would go up. That's what a simulator could tell us about. And in the second case, if we do ramp metering, it would tell us that actually congestion would go down as well as maybe emissions. And this is basically how we use a simulation-based scenario um, evaluation to then test and model um, measures and effects of different outcomes in real time. And we could then decide which measure to implement also in real time. This now this brings us already to the end of this short presentation and I hope I gave you a overview of what a um, automated scenario generation means, how can we run them and also how can we evaluate then measures in real time based on traffic simulations. And I'm happy to basically answer any questions via email. And I hope that the next time that we meet, it's going to be in person. Thank you very much for your interest and I wish you all the best. Thank you.